Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, I, I guess that for the next 45 minutes I will uh, talk um, a little about morality and pain. <coughs> and more specifically I will talk about the connection between extreme rituals and uh, morality. Uh, morality in a broader sense than uh, what Sahar talked. It's not just uh, unethical behavior, but it's also prosocial behavior. Uh, now, before going there, uh, usually do something else. I'm sorry for all my <laughs> students' names here. Uh, I have some of my students in here, and that's really nice. Uh, so, uh, Sahar said uh, something about signing uh, the paper that he gave to his students a paper to sign, and uh, for some of students signed for others. So, I have solved this problem by placing my eyes and Andreas Roebster's eyes on the paper and we were thinking that that's going to be a good uh, you know, a priming factor to make uh, uh, students be very good. Of course, at the same time, I have very ethical students. So that helps, okay? But you know, we try to help them a bit with uh, the eyes there. And uh, now, what, what we try to do with the eyes is to, to make people to cheat less and just very quickly I will talk about it. I, I'm talking about it mainly because I think that the rest of my slides on extreme rituals will not uh, exceed the half an hour. So I just add a uh, slide quickly. Uh, so what do we know from experimental work? We know uh, from an experiment that uh, Ariely and uh, colleagues run. I don't remember who the colleagues are and I'm sorry. Nino Mazar. Nino Mazar, there you go. Sahar knows everything. The Ten Commandments, so basically people who were asked to recall the Ten Commandments before the, the task, before the cheating task, uh, did not cheat at all, regardless on uh, how many commandments they managed to recall uh, correctly or uh, not. Uh, they had uh, another experiment with a honor code. They asked from people at MIT and Yale to read the honor code before the cheating task. Same results, people didn't see it after reading the horror code uh, versus control, that they didn't read the honor code. Uh, interestingly, neither MIT nor Yale have a honor code. So that's, you know, it's enough if you read something that will remind you of your own morality and it will remind you of morality in the world. Uh, so basically it doesn't have to do with a cost-benefit analysis but about reminders. Uh, eyes on the wall, this is a very famous experiment uh, I think early 2000 from uh, Bateson uh, and colleagues they put some eyes on the wall that they work subliminally people didn't mm -hmm. notice the eyes on the wall but they still behaved prosocially they gave more money for coffee and milk in uh, the canteen of the lab of their lab uh, but when they removed the eyes from the wall people uh, gave less money for coffee and milk so basically, eyes on the world work as a subconscious reminder of uh, giving and sharing and uh, being a moral and good person. We did uh, run uh, another uh, lab study uh, where we basically ran a similar experiment, but this time we used, uh, we compared three dimensional representations of faces and we convert it to two-dimensional representation of the same faces and controls. So we used for controls flowers, uh, three-dimensional, two-dimensional flowers. What we find again is that the more the dimensions, uh, the more people give for uh, Red Bull products. Uh, we got the Red Bull for free from Red Bull, so that was nice. Uh, uh, in another experiment, uh, again, I think that it was uh, Ariely with a contract signing. It, was it also you? I'm not sure. There you go. So it, just ask Sahar for mm -hmm. the literature. Uh, they asked for people to sign a contract in the beginning of the contract or at the, at the end of the contract, as this is, as the norm is, as the you know what people do normally do. What happened? <laughs> Who knows what happened? In the beginning of the contract, at the end of the contract? Beginning works better. Exactly. Beginning works better. Why is that? Before taking a decision. 
I didn't hear you. It's before taking each decision. Yeah, basically what you do is that you, you know, you commit to the whole thing in advance and then you do not cheat and you do uh, complete what the contract uh, says uh, that you should complete. So in the end, you know, you have already cheated, you have already justified uh, to yourself what you can do, what you cannot do, how you can go around the uh, little, uh, you know, details of the contract. So basically all these we can say, and especially the two first, we can say that they are environmental cues that uh, create an ethical, non-corrupt behavior. And they create an ethical environment. As I have talked about a, uh, a non-corrupt environment. And uh, basically think, think of uh, another experiment that we, we ran. We had people to... Uh, play a public goods game or it was a common pool game in a restaurant and in a temple, in a Hindu temple. And what we find there is that people are more prosocial when they play the common pool game in the temple rather than in the restaurant. It makes sense because, you know, the temple is full of all these environmental cues, of eyes looking at you, statues of gods, uh, that they remind you, they, they look at you, you cannot sit, and they remind you of your own moral self. They make you to be more prosocial and more of a caring person for the others. Uh, yes, I don't know why I do that. Uh, again, that's because this is our own experiment, so I want to point it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if I talk too quickly, just please let me know. Before I get into some specific experiments, some specific cases, I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, lab versus the field. Uh, in anthropology, because I have a master's in anthropology, I had a master's in anthropology, I think I've forgotten most of it, we call it the wild. Uh, so going, going to the lab and going to the wild to run experiments. And uh, I think that this is quite representative of what people think of the wild, what anthropologists think of the wild. Uh, you don't find these people often in the wild. Um, now, experimenters sometimes dismiss some of the more <coughs> qualitative approaches as they consider that they produce messy results. You know, going to the wild, going to the field is like a, it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing. Uh, and uh, the results sometimes cannot really be verified because these approaches lack control, uh, they lack proper testing and sometimes even cannot be uh, generalized. Uh, on the other hand, humanists dismiss laboratory evidence produced in the field as kind of decontextualized and unrealistic, not related to real life. You know, the lab is like a sterilized environment. It, we, we cannot generalize our, uh, our findings. I, I, I disagree with both. Uh, these uh, aphorisms. Uh, I do not see qualitative and experimental methods as uh, antagonistic, but uh, as complementary for the understanding of a very specific phenomenon. Um, each of them, each of the approaches uh, and each of the you know, experimental settings, basically, can offer types of evidence that the other basically cannot do. So the one complements the other. Uh, and this is why uh, during the last few years, and with some very uh, smart colleagues, uh, I've been working on a hybrid approach, namely combining the two approaches. What we normally try to do is that we try to take an advantage of the field and bring the lab out there, and at the same time then we return to the lab and we say, okay, what did we find in the field? We found that. Let's try to test it. Let's try to find a way to test it. Let's try to find a way to, to you know, get into the mechanism of what produced that uh, effect, that phenomenon. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice trip from the field to the lab and back to the field and back to the lab. Uh, but I think that is pretty interesting and it's, uh, you know, it's fun. So, through the presentation of two case studies, of two experiments that we ran during the last uh, couple of years, uh, I will talk about the physiological effects that extreme rituals have on moral and pro-social behavior. Uh, 
So definitely one problem that I do not have uh, going to the field uh, is the moral dilemma of uh, inducing pain to my participants because they do it themselves. Uh, and actually they do it in a way that you cannot do it in the lab. Probably. Uh, we've gone as close as possible to it, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, although I don't have slides. So, what we call extreme rituals, as you will very easily figure out from the rest of the presentation, are uh, fascinating and pretty weird acts that entail excessive costs, mental pain, physical pain, effort, and spent energy without any obvious equal benefits. People do all these things and you really don't know why they do it. What is the benefit? They don't even have an excuse. You know, when you ask them, when you're in the field for uh, a couple of months, you just figure out that they just have no idea. You ask them, why do you do it? God told me. Uh, why did God tell you? Uh, well, you know, he uh, killed another God and after that he decided that we should do this ritual piercing ourselves. Something like this. Um, some examples of uh, extreme rituals uh, are fire walking, walking on fire or walking on uh, uh, fired coals, uh, body piercing and uh, self-mutilating rituals. We have to always keep in mind that religious rituals are probably the most prominent tools, uh, tool of, uh, of religions to regulate moral behavior. And uh, again, we have to keep in mind that religions are probably the largest organizations in the world, together with Apple and Google. <laughs> so, especially Apple, I think, it's more of a religious organization. It's more of a cult. Yes, it's more of a cult, exactly. Yeah, now they have also a god that passed away and he will resurrect, I guess. So. Uh, moral and especially prosocial behavior describes individuals that they contribute their own resources and effort in order to uh, mutually benefit the whole group. Okay? Uh, prominent examples of moral behavior is, for example, donating your money, uh, volunteering your efforts and your time, or cooperating. Uh, such behavior is uh, not in line with the standard economic model, it's not good in the standard economic model. According to the rational agent model to cooperate, to donate, it doesn't really make any sense. You know, we should keep, we should maximize our uh, utility and we should keep our resources for ourselves. Uh, and especially when, for example, trusting others or cooperating with others is a very risky thing to do because maybe they would just not uh, uh, reciprocate. They will maybe, you know, be bad people and not trust us. So we lose our time, our money, our resources. At the same time, this kind of behavior uh, does not make sense uh, evolutionarily either. Uh, and it has been suggested since the 19th century from uh, famous sociologists like uh, Emil Durkheim uh, that moral behavior can be fostered by rituals, by, and especially by extreme rituals. Now, in order to find out what is the connection between extreme rituals and morality, uh, we went to Mauritius. Who has been in Mauritius? Sahar. Three people. Very good. That's, it's, it's actually the first time that I have people that have been in Mauritius in the past. I have a coin. You have, he, yeah, Ori has a coin from Mauritius and he doesn't know how he got it. Somebody cheated him. Um, okay, so Mauritius is uh, one of the most diverse societies in the world. There is tremendous ethnic, uh, linguistic and religious diversity. Actually, when you first read about, you know, the demographics of Mauritius, you basically think that it's impossible for such different people like the Mauritians to live uh, in the same place, uh, on a pretty small island, actually. You would think that the one would kill the other. Uh, they are 1.3, I think that now they should be like 1.4 million people. They speak 15 different languages. Uh, most of them are multilingual. Most of the Mauritians speak three or four languages. Uh, they are from many different populations. Chinese, Hindu, uh, Arabs, locals, Europeans. And uh, 
they believe in five different major religions plus some nuances of them black magic white magic like it's it's a mess it's a terrible mess when it comes to uh, religion and uh, language uh, diversity in Mauritius now what's the good thing the good thing is that Mauritius is an amazing place it's a paradise uh, Mark Twain said that uh, I mean, this, this time is really Mark Twain who said it, okay? Uh, he said that uh, Mauritius, if there is one paradise on earth, that's, in, uh, that's Mauritius. Uh, the other good thing is that Mauritius is an extremely peaceful place. There are extreme rituals in many places in the world. Most of the places are not very welcoming. Uh, these people live in complete harmony with each other. Uh, so. Actually, it's very interesting. The government uh, has uh, uh, voted some laws that all the populations have to celebrate at least one religious uh, celebration from another religious community. So basically, everybody celebrates Christmas in Mauritius. Mm -hmm. Everybody. And they are very happy with it. Uh, this is called syncretism in religion. Okay, So when you actually bring in elements from other religions in your own religion, that's called syncretism. And uh, so you will find uh, uh, out of uh, some Hindu temples, you will see uh, the statue of uh, Maria, uh, uh, Christian, should I say, goddess, probably. Uh, and when you ask the priest of the temple, and I did ask the priest of the temple, so why, you know, you're a Hindu, why do you have a Christian uh, goddess out of your temple? And he says, you know, I mean, they are all, um, I, I have a temple devoted to Kali, she is a mother, Maria is a mother, we celebrate them both, we uh, do both, uh, we, we act rituals for both, and uh, it's the same thing for us. Now, uh, another characteristic of the island is that there are also plenty of rituals, and uh, some of the rituals that you will find in Mauritius are among the most extreme you will find in the world. Uh, as I said before, Mauritians do facial and body piercing, they do fire walking, they walk on swords, they, they basically do everything that you can imagine when it comes to extreme rituals. Uh, unfortunately, we did not go there for uh, vacations, but we went there for, to study their rituals. We did have two days of holidays. They were both not very relaxed. And they were not very relaxed because we, yeah. Yeah. Once almost drowned. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 not it's not a very like you, you have to take like thirty days to have holidays. We usually go there for fifteen days. Sahar came there for a, what a night or two? Yeah, something like this. So there was no time. Actually, Sahar got some holidays because he didn't help us much. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have a little uh, little water, please? Because I'm yeah. 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 Good. All right. So, in the field, you basically face uh, many practical challenges, first and foremost. Uh, one thing, for example, is time. Uh, these rituals take place once a year, sometimes even more rarely. Basically, you have a day, right? You have a day to run your experiment. If it rains, you're screwed. If uh, something goes wrong, you're screwed. If you don't have uh, electricity, you're screwed. If you don't have a, a, a house, you're screwed. You, basically, there are many uh, you know, ways that you're screwed and one way to succeed. So, one particular issue is how do you run 40, 50, uh, 60 or 80 participants in three or four hours max. Okay, that's one thing uh, that you have to figure out. Uh, another thing, as I said, is where to run those participants. You need power. You need to for your computers. You need, uh, as I said, protection from the rain. You need a quiet uh, and seclusion from uh, uh, the cows that is around you. Uh, the, these kind of rituals are really chaotic. Mauritian people are even more chaotic than their rituals. So you need a private place and you have to try to, you know, tell them not to be there, not to be around because they just bother the participants. Uh, in both the studies we did run, we got 
tremendous support from the local communities. And without that, it's just impossible to run an experiment in the wild. Uh, especially the temple officials, in both cases, uh, they helped us recu recruit uh, participants by announcing the study to their devotees, to the devotees of the temple. And uh, they also allowed us to use uh, buildings that belong to the community or the temple so that we can go in and set up our, you know, iPads and laptops. Uh, but for this to happen, uh, one needs to, um, to establish these connections. In anthropology, we call these people the gatekeepers, the, the key keepers, right? So you have to go there, you have to find who the gatekeepers are, you have to talk to them, you have to tell them that what you're going to do is good for them and their community, you have to tell them that they are going to help science or, you know, all these kind of things that we basically say to ourselves when being at the university. Uh, so you need to work on that kind of relations long before you go there to run the ritual. Uh, some other issues we had is, for example, to find the coins in order to play our games. Uh, in order to play our games, we needed lots of cash and we needed uh, particularly coins of uh, 20s in uh, both our tasks. In the first study, we used about 1,200 coins. Uh, we used uh, almost twice as much in the second study. And this is the first study, so imagine what's the second study, uh, how the second study looks like. Uh, in order to get these coins, you have to be inventive. Uh, so going to the bank in Mauritius is a little bit of a... It's a little bit of a, an issue, right? When your credit most card of them, yeah, most of first, so your credit card cannot give you this amount. Uh, you go to the bank and they tell you, you know, we don't have these uh, coins. And why should we give you this amount of coins? What are you going to do? Uh, so the second time we were luckier, we went to the bank a couple of times with Catherine. We managed to get coins. Then we went back again and they said, ah, the coin people. Uh, the first time we had to be a little bit more in inventive. One night we, we were like desperate because we didn't have enough money. We went to a casino uh, and we were placing uh, uh, paper bills in the casino, in the slot machines. And we were pushing the button and we were getting them in coins of 20s. And uh, we did that several times, like three or four people. Um, Apparently, uh, at, at some point they found out that we are doing this thing instead of, you know, wasting our money in the slot machines and a couple of really big guys came to us and uh, politely told us to leave the casino. Uh, so there are some dangers in the field, even in the most peaceful places like Mauritius. Okay, so as I said before, has long been argued that intense collective rituals promote prosocial attitudes and behaviors. However, till 2013, we didn't have any studies of real life rituals that have examined how ritual intensity affects social dynamics. Uh, we basically conducted the first investigation of those effects in a natural setting by comparing religious rituals that by in levels of intensity. Uh, this ritual is called Taipu Sam Kavadi. Kavadi is basically the last day of the ritual. I will talk about the ritual and I will show you some pictures of it. Taipu Sam commemorates the day on which God Murugan, and I will show you the God in a while, uh, he is the Hindi God of war and victory. And he was given a spear by Parvati, which is the reincarnation of the first wife of the Hindu supreme god Shiva. As you can see, the family relations in the uh, Hindu god, uh, uh, gods are pretty complicated. So Murugan, with this uh, spear, was able to save the Hindus from the evil demon Surapadam. Accordingly, Taipusam is used to pray to God in order to receive his grace and purification and to overcome obstacles. So what happens during the ritual? It's, it is a Tamil Hindu ritual, so basically it takes place also in South India, which is a Tamil uh, area. 
Uh, it's as I said called Taiku Sam Kavadi and it is performed by many many thousands of people and lasts for about a week. Participants, this is Murga. That's Gat Murga. And this is the temple. Uh, the, the temple of our first time. It's a really, really amazing temple. And as you can see, also little kids can take part in the ritual or older people. Um, so participants prepare for the festival uh, by engaging in a number of cleansing uh, activities such as praying and fasting for weeks before the actual celebration, before the, the last week, the, the main week of the ritual. For the first six consecutive days, everybody climbs up uh, on a hill in this particular temple, in our first study, climb, climbs up on a hill of 242 steps. You can see some of the steps here. I can tell you that uh, if you are not uh, like Sahar, a marathon runner, twice going up and down can kill you, basically. It's 30 degrees there and 100% humidity, so it's really not very pleasant to climb up and down. Uh, the temple is up there, and what they do for the first six days is that they go up there and pray. Uh, so, basically this ritual, for a foreigner like me, for a non-local like me, the first day is really fascinating because you know you get to see the temple, you get to meet the people. The second day is still fun. It's windy and you have a nice view. Uh, you can see the whole island. The third day starts to be a little bit boring. By the sixth day, you really don't want to be up there. I mean, it's just people going up there, praying for six, seven hours, going down. Going up there, praying for six, seven hours, going down. This is what happens the first six days. Uh, on the last day, they all go in the morning to a river bank, uh, which is uh, about six kilometers away from the temple, and they pierce themselves. They, all of them pierce themselves. The men, women, kids. Um, and then the process back to the temple begins. When the piercing finishes, uh, at around nine or ten o'clock in the morning, the they start walking towards the temple, the six kilometers. Some of them having more than 100, 150 hooks all over their body, hands, legs, uh, uh, on their chest and belly, on their back, and uh, of course face. The face hooks are particularly elaborated. They have chains that connect, for example, the hooks on the uh, eyes to the mouth, and from the mouth it can go up to the nose and you can have you know several nice decorations of their uh, face um, some of them walk on nail shoes uh, almost all the distance uh, they carry the cavadi on their shoulders this is a cavadi yeah you can see this is a cavadi is a construction made of uh, bamboo it's about 40 45 kilograms, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. It's more. Uh, now some of them, as you can see here, carry a second cavity. The second cavity they carry it with the skin of their back. They are not allowed to touch the ropes. Okay? And that's why you will see that many of them carry this uh, uh, stick so that they have their hands um, occupied with uh, something else. You can see that this guy actually carries this thing behind him. I would think that it's like at least 80 kilograms, uh, the cavity that he carries. And at that point he is uh, exhausted. Once they arrive to the hill, they climb up these uh, 242 steps and they take the hooks off. Specialists do the piercing and specialists take the hooks off. The priest and his friends and his, uh, you know... Specialists. Yes, yes. <laughs> specialists, right. But they have been, they have been, they, they, they are named specialists by the priest. Uh, in this temple is the priest and uh, his family. In the other temple is uh, the priest and his friends. Uh, yeah. So, after they take the, hook the hooks off, they come down and they eat all together. 
this is a very particular element of almost all the rituals, uh, all the communal rituals that I've seen. People eat, have a dinner together after the whole thing finishes. And I think that that's very interesting. All right, now I will show you a video. Some of uh, you have seen it, some of you haven't. Uh, it's a little bit of harsh. You are allowed to leave the room. <laughs> Can we close the window so that we have the whole sound experience, please? <laughs> interesting things with this uh, particular piercing is that uh, when the process back to the temple uh, started we were we, we noticed that this guy walks uh, pretty um, alone no one else was around him so we were like the hell do they cause such pain to him and then they leave him alone uh, then we asked the people and uh, we actually interviewed also him the day after he couldn't really speak very clearly but you know, he could. Uh, the reason why people do not walk around him but only his family and again in the distance is because if you touch the piercings, his uh, um, Cheek. cheeks will basically, you know, uh, yeah, well, it, it wouldn't be very fun anyway. Uh, there are some, uh, some other people pierce themselves with uh, like this guy over here. Yes, this guy over here, he pierced himself with a, a weightlift bar. Oh. Usually these guys are 
younger, and uh, they are uh, they go a little bit aside from the rest, and they do the piercings alone. They are like a group of adolescents or uh, you know young uh, in their 90s, 20s, uh, and they they are poorer. That's another characteristic. They are of kind of a lower social status, and they try to get uh, to gain in social status by doing harsh things to themselves. The, you know, I mean, you. I guess that you all remember yourself uh, when you were adolescent. You used to do, you know, stupid things. Uh, yeah, this guy most of the times uh, holds it because if it, he leaves it, his whole jaw will break. Uh, that's a, actually one of the few uh, seconds that he left it, and he was able to bite it uh, with his uh, teeth so that it doesn't. Anyway, okay, questions? Yes? Do it, okay, a couple questions. Do the same people do it year after year or only when they're young? And if I thought I said an older person, do they say it gets easier as it, like when you've done it multiple you times? You kind of get used to it. I mean, I've seen that video many times, so even I got used to the idea that people pierce themselves in such a harsh way. But uh, some people do it for more than a year. <coughs> Uh, like two or three years and usually what happens is that they say okay God Muruga please uh, give health to my family and I'll do the ritual for three years and basically the more you will do it the higher the favor you ask right? or the higher the favor the more you will do it uh, there are some people who do it just once in their life there are some people who don't do it at all there is no uh, explicit at least social pressure to do the ritual, to participate in the ritual. It doesn't mean that you are outcasted if you don't do it. Again, this is just an anthropological observation. I'm not so sure if that's the case. Okay? But probably there is social pressure. Maybe there's no obligation, right? But there's... I guess that there is a, definitely a peer pressure when you are young. Uh, and some kind of yeah, social pressure that you know you have, if you are Hindu and a Tamil, you have to participate in this ritual at least once. Uh, and there are also like kind of, you know, you of, obviously you can see that there are different levels of participating and we will talk about these levels later, but you know, you can have one piercing or you can have one whole wave bar. So, you know, or these two uh, 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 piercings that uh, this guy did. Yes? Do you have any idea how the other religions look at this thing? Yes, we do have an idea. Uh, we, what we have observed is that they do not look at it as something strange. They respect it. They, there are many Christians and Muslims who take part in it uh, as uh, distant observers, distant observers. And uh, I don't think that it's the you know touristic observing. It's more like that you know. I mean, they come to our temples. We should go to their temples. So there is no stigmatism, is that a word? Probably. Yeah. By doing this ritual that you are, you know, hey, what are you doing? You are like that. Uh, yeah. Yes. Mm, I was thinking there are very, 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 very similar um, rituals in Catholic Spain. Mostly, yeah. I guess, southern Spain. Yeah. And, yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm starting to think, because you asked if the, how, or how, yeah, how it's religion looks at these things, but it's more than religion, so I would say you have to talk about a lower organizational level, maybe sect or cult, or because this is, this is I don't know, it's like the, um, the skin is different, or the uh, layout is different in Christian uh, rituals and this ritual, but the, the basis is the same, they do the same stuff. Uh, and it has to do, I guess, with the way the society is organized and the kind of contact they have, yeah. which yeah. in this yeah. case should be similar in southern Spain and this place, mm -hmm. Mauritius. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So in the first study, we focused on the effect of engagement in the ritual on donations, uh, while also we tried to assess the effect on religious and national identity theory. Uh, so, uh, in the in the in a field study, you do not manipulate your setting as you do in a lab study. 
but you try to work around it. So you basically find the conditions prepared for you and you just, you know, test them. So basically what we have here is three naturally occurring conditions, two rituals, both part of the same festival, the first six days and the last day, and attended by the same people at the same place. One of higher intensity ritual uh, and uh, one lower intensity ritual. And furthermore, we have the Kavadi participants that consist in active performers and observers. The observers basically, what they do is that they simply follow the procession without engaging in any painful activity. So they don't have piercings. They don't carry a Kavadi and they don't have piercings. So participants participate in the ritual to, base, to, 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 to different degrees uh, that allow in the end for three, as I said, naturally occurring conditions, uh, these three. Now, uh, we wanted to compare these two rituals in terms of pro-social behavior. And to do so, we used an economic experiment, which basically was a dictator game towards the temple. It's a donation task. Uh, and we also used questionnaires and scales on social identity and pain. Now, how we did it is that after performing the ritual, our local assistants went and recruited participants of <coughs> different levels, and uh, we asked them to answer some questions on the computer, like age, uh, gender, uh, etc. And uh, after they answered our questions, we told them, okay, thank you very much, take these 200 Mauritian rupees in coins of 20, 20s, and uh, please leave. Well, we gave them also an envelope. Um, and uh, the envelope, they, 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 in the exit of the, of, the, of the room, there was a, a private booth where they could go in and donate money or not, to the local temple. So it was an in-group donation. Okay? Uh, a couple of interesting details in our design. One thing is that when you ask from Mauritians, for example, how religious you are, they will tell you extremely religious. Okay? If you give them a scale from uh, 1 to 10 and uh, ask them just to point with a pen, they will go all of them to 10, some of them to 11. So basically what you, you have an, we have an issue there, you have an issue there when you run this kind of studies in the, in the wild because there is a huge danger for ceiling effects. Uh, so what we did is that we designed a, a little sliding bar on a computer that one needed to hit the right or left button at least 20 times in order to reach the ceiling or the floor. So it took some effort from them. And you know, it, this was like a way around uh, getting ceilings or uh, floor uh, effects. Now, another issue we had is how we would be able to run all those people in short time uh, without... Uh, we didn't have time to go and open each individual envelope and see, okay, this, is, this guy is a performer and he donated 100 rupees. So what we did is that we, and at the same time, of course, keep their anonymity because we didn't want any names and stuff on the, on the questionnaire or on the envelope. What we did is that we print on the envelopes a serial number instead of the Orkus University post box. So instead of 8,000, we had 8,000, 8,001, 8,002. The same serial number was on the questionnaire that, uh, and then we could basically, you know, uh, uh, correspond the envelope to the questionnaire and figure out if this guy had piercings, how many piercings he had, how much he said that he, it hurt it hurted him, and uh, all these uh, yeah, questions. Okay, so what do you think we found? Please, only the ones who haven't read the article. Juan? Yeah, I mean, I read the article. Okay. <laughs> you were Sahar's favorite guy, so I was thinking that you would have an intuition. Someone else? You read the article, don't look at me like this. Okay. Yeah, but I've told you, you've you've seen you've seen, I, uh, you've seen people I presenting. The results, so you don't you don't uh, I don't read. <laughs> you don't read? No. I, I know that. But the results, so. 
Okay, so results. So the donations, so basically prosocial acts towards an in-group, increase as one's engagement in the ritual increases. That is that the participants of the low intensity ritual donated less than the participants of the higher intensity ritual. Also, we found a correlation between pain and donation. Uh, lastly, we found that the level of engagement was negatively correlated to the identity feeling as a Hindu. That is basically that the more the suffering, the, the less you identify with your own religion, but the more you identify with the whole nation itself. What is what? The, the deep planet, the, the orange bar. It's donations in uh, Mauritian rupees. So this is the low intensity ritual and this is the high intensity ritual. Observer and this is observers and performers. So observer. This is not a significant difference. But uh, I will talk about it later. You didn't even read our article or what? <laughs> <laughs> But they Don't give the whole <laughs> secret. I will ask about it. Just remain silent. Someone else who wants to talk? <laughs> yes. Uh, could you uh, talk again about the uh, correlation between identity and pain suffering report? Yes, so that's here. That's no, that's here. There you go. Okay. So basically what we find is that uh, uh, the more you have engaged in the ritual, the more you feel as part of your nation, as part of uh, Mauritius, you, the more you feel Mauritian, rather than Hindu. And these people are Hindus. So the more it means you, you hate your religion because it hurts you? <sighs> so why would you to identify with your country? With you may country? say so. Uh, the country in that, in that uh, sense is more of an inclusive. Uh, so you feel as a member of a larger group. But you have just done something which is very specific to right. your religion. Right. So it's and uh, yeah, this is this is one, uh, a very a very important question that we basically do not have a very clear answer to because the the standard hypothesis would be that you know when you do something for your religion, of course you would be first of all you would be more exclusive. You will not like the other. You will become more of an in group. Hey, we did this our thing and we are now strong as an in group. We didn't find that. We found that people identify more with, you know, Christians and uh, 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 Europeans. Can I ask again, what was the exact measure of pain? Was it self-report indicating that the more pain they felt, mm -hmm. the more Mauritian they felt? Mm -hmm. Because maybe what they're doing actually is the more Hinduist they feel, the least pain they report. Yes, mm -hmm. it is probable. It is because, probable. I mean, I would say that's an expectation. Of course, of, of course, it is. It is probable. Yes, and uh, yeah, this is uh, part of uh, part of the article. We do discuss this. That we we cannot exclude the one and the other. Uh, Hello. Yes. Sorry. Um, you when you measure that uh, sense of belonging, you use those scales like you showed us with Mauritian on one side mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, Hindu on the other side, mm -hmm. and the description uh, under it. What yeah, with, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, but that also seems kind of a bit counterintuitive to me. It would make, make more sense to me at least to have two scales where you have to determine yourself on, on the two rather than here when you do it, when you're saying that you're more Mauritian, you are automatically saying that you're less Hindu mm -hmm. and vice versa, yeah. which aren't necessarily opposites. Yeah. So these, these are all uh, basically restrictions of the field on, on how these people think. About things. So one characteristic thing in Mauritius is that people do not basically really separate their ethnicity with their religion. So if you ask a Chinese uh, Hinduist what you are, what's your ethnicity, uh, and we have done that. Uh, she told me I'm a Hindu. I'm a Hindu. Hinduist. That's what I am. And I, I tried to push her on the obvious fact that she's Chinese. And it seemed like that she simply doesn't, because she was converted, uh, because of her husband. And she simply didn't want to, you know, go there. Uh, so there is this kind of, you know, confusion, I would think, between these two. And yeah, there are like many things that we could do different. Well, I mean, but I think what we wanted to then to 
to think is exactly that this is a special case, right? Yeah. So if you tell me you're more Hindu, that means that you're less Mauritian. Then people like, conceptualize Mauritius, like, Mauritian as we wanted them to, and that is being a plural, um, plural society. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of prime them to, to use them as opposites. But then it is kind of less ecological in that Yes, sense. yes. It yes. is it's a yes. certain concept yes. that we ap apply on them. Yes. In that moment. You make the thing in the, into that yeah. context. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Can I ask something too? Yes, yes, of course. Can you go back yeah. just to, to see the results? So, am I right that all the measurements are after? The after the ritual, ritual, either the low intensity or high intensity, yes. And just so after. So one concern, um, one obvious concern is that there's self-selection into these treatments and then that can explain everything. It doesn't have to be about the ritual, it has to be about the type of person that chooses to participate. I wouldn't think so. And the reason why I wouldn't think so is because uh, of, uh, of ethnographic reasons. These people do not, uh, all these people will eventually self-select to be here or here, from year to year. You see what I mean? It's not a it's not a clear way out of what you say, but it is the best way out of what you say. No so, way. so these people were were last year here or here. Okay. These people could easily be here. So, but it, okay, it still reflects their uh, point taken. It still reflects course. their state of mind at that. Of course, that of, year, course. That of course, of course, of course. But you changed. This exactly to the next study. Yes, and yes. Yeah. Okay, basically, no, basically, exactly. basically, some of the questions and some of the weaknesses of this uh, design and of this experiment will be answered to. So my uh, idea is a pre and post. Right. Yeah. Yes. Because, uh, maybe yes. it's because I read the paper. Obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> basically, what we can uh, say here is that uh, uh, we have a natural demonstration with uh, weaknesses and uh, you know strong parts that suffering within a ritual context, either actively or passively perceived, uh, supports pro-sociality. Uh, and this is where I would like uh, you to focus, because uh, we humans are very complicated in nature, and our psychology is really all over the place. So, you know, it's what uh, we were discussing yesterday with Sahar and Guy, that one study basically is never enough. Uh, uh, it's never enough to reveal the whole picture. Uh, and uh, a careful researcher like Saha, who knows the study, of course, and that's why he figured that out, would notice something here. And where the issue is here... Do you see an issue here? Do you see a little problem? Try to focus uh, here. There's something missing. It's uh, A or B. Where do you see a kind of a problem? Something that would raise a question. Something that would, you would say, mm, but look, this is not really... This shouldn't be the case. Is that the uh, observer? Or... No, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. Yeah, you are on a good way. <laughs> you are on a good way. Come on, spell it out. But it's not a significant no, difference. Missing. It's not a significant yeah. difference. But the problem, they, there, is a, there is a trend. There is a trend that says that, uh, and now basically you cannot see what is under, so I will go back. Uh, observers are more prosocial than performers. And that basically doesn't really fit with the original hypothesis. You would think that the more you, you help yourself, the more you will donate. Right? But you don't see that here. And Guy shakes his hand like a Hindu, so he has a, an idea. Yes? is not caused by pain or suffering itself, but by expectations of suffering. And so yes. people who haven't actually perceived or felt the pain, they need to report more pain so that they feel included in the pain sphere. Maybe. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. And what, what we basically, what we were basically thinking uh, in, in my group is that maybe there is another mechanism here. Maybe pain is not the issue, or pain is part of the picture, or maybe there are two mechanisms uh, that are uh, you know, working together. So we went back to the island to have some more holidays and find out what happens. In this second study, we propose that 
the view that rituals do only one thing basically loses sight of the big picture. We hypothesize that extreme rituals do not facilitate only and necessarily moral behavior, but rather activate different mechanisms to participants based on where one stands, if you are a performer or if you are an observer. On the one hand, performers, and Sahar talked a little bit about it, on the one hand, performers might donate less as their performance has basically cleansed them from their past bad deeds, by, the, by, by their sins. Therefore, now licenses uh, a less social behavior. Uh, on the other hand, observers might actually donate more as watching the performance uh, of the others, that they are part of their in-group, so they are friends, family, have reminded them of their unfulfilled moral duties, of a norm, of a social norm that they didn't fulfill this time. So they are using the donation task as a cleansing mechanism itself. They say, okay, well, I didn't do anything, I better pay a little bit money, a little bit more money. Uh, more specifically, what we say is that moral licensing mechanisms are activated to performers and are not activated to observers, leading to diametrically different behaviors. Uh, so, as I said, we went back and we tested whether high ritual intensity leads uh, people to behave morally. Uh, this time we used a different task, this time we test uh, dishonesty. Uh, we used the die, or as called a cheating task. Uh, following the ritual, participants entered a room near the temple. The room stood separated from the temple and had no pictures on the wall or anything reminding of some religious setup. And this is pretty important because we have studies showing that religious setups are not, uh, you know, they don't give you a very you know, a clear setup. So we run uh, also a control group uh, trials at a room within the university campus within a pretty similar setup. Uh, this control group served basically as a benchmark to indicate what typically happens when completing a, 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 the die task twice at a specific time interval. Uh, based on previous research showing that there is an effect of time of the day on unethical behavior, we made sure to run the study at the same time each day. And that actually the, the whole ritual helped us with that because, you know, it was finishing at the same time. So. The time interval was identical to the interval uh, used in uh, all conditions. Now, how, how the task is uh, played, so this is a box, and there is a hole uh, here on the bottom that I made while at Guy's house with a little... Uh, you still need to clean the... And I still need to clean the, the dirt that I made there. And actually, Sahar found out that they now, oh no, it, it was it you that they yeah, now have a 3D printer. I can printer. send you the picture, they use a 3D printer to print something like that. With a hole. With a nice hole. So you don't need to, you know, make really the hole uh, manually anymore, this is really cool. Uh, what you, what the task, what the ta what you do during the task is that you ask the participant to roll the die in the box and just take a look at the, uh, at the number and self-report the, the number. The higher the number, the more the money. 1 means 10 Mauritian rupees, 2 means 20, 6 means 60. They played the task three times per, uh, three times for themselves, so basically all the money <coughs> went to them, all the money they would self-report, they went to them. They played, uh, they played it three times for their best friend, that they uh, told us his or her name in advance, and they played three times for a stranger. What we told them in the stranger condition is that uh, that uh, we will give the money to another habitant of the island but that they have never met, they will never meet, and he doesn't live around. The instructions also stated explicitly that neither the experimenter nor anybody else could control the numbers entered. And that's quite obvious because we simply couldn't see it, so they could say whatever they, uh, they wanted. 
So a moral behavior in this case is operationalized as a number that participant reports. We had a pretty balanced sample. We had uh, 85 participants, 43 females. Uh, 60 of them performed the ritual. Uh, 25 are students uh, at the Mauritius University, the control group. Uh, from the 60 ritual participants, 30 of them are performers and 30 are observers. Uh, our prediction again is that performers would activate moral licensing mechanisms that would lead them to feel entitled to cheat this time more for selfish reasons after the participation in the ritual. We completed the task twice. I don't know if I, I don't even remember if I say that. We completed the task before the ritual and after the ritual with the same people. And in Mauritius University, we went one day, asked them to complete the task, and then we went the day after and we asked them to complete the same task again, the same people. Okay? And that was a hell, let me tell you. So we gave them all uh, some. Um, how do you call these things that you wear on your hand? Wristbands. Yes. So that basically they remember, we told them, okay, now you completed the task once, please remember to give it back to me after the ritual. And um, so they came back to us because it was hard to find them in this, this you know, huge population participating in the ritual. Um, we also thought that observers would sit less after participating in the ritual, in the extreme ritual, because of feelings that they did not pay their duties. And therefore the die task would work uh, for them as a cleansing mechanism that would compensate for not being active during the ritual. Uh, it, interestingly enough, that's almost ironic because what we, if we are right, what we have here is a purification ritual, uh, Kavadi is a purification ritual, that ironically works only for the people who observe it and not for the people who take really part in it. It doesn't purify the people who really the stuff and uh, we were right I have to say uh, so although we are unable to detect whether each individual was honest we can estimate the honesty by comparing the observed fraction of reported outcomes with a 50% honest result which is the 3.5 uh, as predicted in the self condition we found that relative to the performers observers of the extreme ritual behave morally after the participation in it, although both groups, and this is extremely interesting, started from the exact same point. That says something about these people, they are the same people, they think the same. They are members of the same village, of the same community, they do the same stuff on an everyday basis, so they behave the same in an ordinary day. Uh, Whereas so performers and control participants demonstrated an increase in their reported outcome, observers demonstrated a decrease in their reported What's the outcomes. Control? Just the control, what do they do during the... It's the nothing. Nothing. It's just one day uh, inter uh, interval in between the two tasks. So this is day one and this is day two that we just found them in the Mauritian University. This was to check if you... That was to check just, just if the task really, you know, uh, it, it, Basically, we wanted to replicate previous studies, but they find that when you play the task once, you kind of learn a little bit that you can sit, so the second time you kind of take a little bit more money. Uh, okay. Um, so this study basically suggests that the main effect of purification ritual may be on those observing it. And uh, interestingly enough, it seems like that extreme rituals uh, seem to focus people on their own profit rather than on the other's profit. Remember that we had a friend and a stranger condition. We did not find any significant differences there. Uh, in my opinion, and I would think in my uh, co-author's opinion, uh, if this finding generalizes, it probably has quite important implications for how we understand and interpret effects of rituals and religion in general on moral behavior. Uh, using a little bit of a more implicit measure, where basically the actual behavior could be masked under participants' overt statements, we found that the increase in the honest behavior manifested among ritual observers even when absent 
among ritual performers. And uh, this may imply that, uh, at least for this ritual, because we are not so sure how much we can generalize, uh, there is an overall communal moral gain from fewer individuals' pain and public sacrifice. I think that that says about uh, something about public sacrifice, sacrifice in general in religion, which is like a major thing, okay? Like Christ sacrificed, the most religious leaders sacrificed uh, for their people. Basically, like, like think about it, if, if rituals have any evolutionary role in terms of ethical behavior, then this could be that few people do something hard and painful for themselves and the, then the larger population takes a moral advantage of it. So there is a benefit uh, from few sacrificing for the whole community. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank Katrin for organizing this workshop and our guests, Guy, Sahar and Ori for coming. This is really great that I have you here, guys. Uh, and this is actually the group that we run the uh, second study. You can see Sahar and Katrin here hugging each other. <laughs> and uh, this is the priest of the you temple. You see that Shaha looks very good in short. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> this is our gatekeeper. And uh, this is uh, the guy who actually did most of the piercings. The uh, specialist. The specialist, exactly. It's interesting to call this guy a specialist. You surgery and you got rejection from this doctor. Mm. Oh, absolutely, that's the guy to go to. So anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>
in the figure. In which figure? The first the one? Airbus. In our yeah, your Airbus. Are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do they represent Airbus or confidence? No, it's. I no, think no, it's Airbus. Airbus. It's Airbus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Airbus. I completely disagree, but please give me your argument. No, okay. You have a trend between the observer and performers, but still, in general, uh, both the result for the pain, people who pain, uh, have more pain, uh -huh. they more, not less. And also, people who uh, did the other ritual, what was the? The praying ritual. Praying. But there so are there maybe, are two there maybe uh, pro social behavior and anti social behavior it's not the exactly. other side of the same coin. Yeah. Uh, so one thing is that we do test two different behaviors that they of course they are, you know, in a way you can think about them as uh, two sides of the same coin, but they are different behaviors. The other thing is that uh, in the first uh, in the first experiment we had an in group donation. So I think I see that also as a problem. We had to find some kind of donation. We had to find some kind of donation that makes sense to the people. We tried to ask, you know, in our ethnographic fieldwork, if I ask you to donate to a school, would that make sense? And they said, why? You know, these people don't really. It doesn't really make sense to them to donate to a school or something like this after we pay them some money. So it kind of makes more sense to ask them for temple. But there are characteristic quality difference between the two. No, oh, but I have a, another idea. The no, idea is that when they took money from us in the antisocial behavior, they took it from us to their community. Okay? To themselves. To themselves, okay, but they could also donate, you don't know. But when they donate the money, they still leave it in their community. They didn't donate it to us. So maybe this is the difference. So if, for example, you run another field study in Mauritius, mm -hmm. now, for example, if you give, okay, this is the money for the community, mm -hmm. and now you can take the money from from your community by reporting on on, on the dialogue, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And and we will, uh, the, it, it's a zero sum game, okay? It's, yes. It's, uh, yes. Then maybe the behavior will be. So interestingly be enough, we have a study like this. We can do it in the lab. We can do it in the lab, and we can do it in the field. We have a kind of a similar study like this with Katri, uh on a blood donation, where we, we ask from people first to play the die task, and then we ask them to donate money. Uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the money that they earn. We haven't really looked at the results yet. Yeah, it was with the blood. I thought you were going to say to donate blood. No, no, these are blood donators. No, okay. yeah. And For then example, we if you ask them to donate to, to research, it will be more, uh, right. more similar. Or right. if you ask, if you give the money to the temple and say, yeah. if I will give all the money to the temple, but if, if you all the die and you have six, you can yeah. take from this yeah. money. Absolutely, no, these are, these are really very good ideas. You know, it's like uh, one can do what one can do in one study. So basically, yeah, absolutely, we should be, uh, we should go back to the field and run stuff. And uh, we are already running stuff in the lab. Uh, 